um, I don't know, what is the date? February 13th. 13th. Okay. And Howard, if you could just get the door, please. Thank you. Oh, but can you do me one other favor? If, if, is Gus still here? Turn off the thing. I'm sure he is. Can you make him turn this off for me, please? Thank you. <laughs> I, there's enough noises in my head. I don't need more. <laughs> okay. So, questions from last time. Which must have been with Rabbi Rosen, right? Because yes. I don't remember last time. Sukkot. <laughs> right, I said to him, it's like Christmas in July. We had Sukkot in February. Any questions about Sukkot? Okay, questions from the reading. Not my favorite reading. Um, I will admit, I was sort of like, why is this relevant? How is this helpful? I don't know. So we'll go through some things and we'll see where we go. Welcome, Alex. So, um, yes, synagogue life as a general sort of concept. Um, so there are some key concepts though, that I want to look at. So what is halacha? Jewish, law. Jewish law. law, great. Um, we have to do this. What does the word mean? What does the word mean? Or what kind of root does it come from? It comes from the Hebrew word meaning to go, to move, to walk. Halacha ani halachet, I am walking in the feminine form. Um, so why? It's the rules we live by, but we go Okay, by. so there's something about us going through them, yep. Why else? Do you have a route because you're supposed to like walk to synagogue? I don't know. Ah, no, but I like the cute association. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's think outside the box. Let's I like that. that. <laughs> yeah. Is there a connotation that they're not fixed and that they they they're movable? They're I'd like to think. Well, and I think that is the point. Law is a process, right? Law is about, and our lawyers can can certainly you know attest to this. Law is about you know a system. It's a process. It's ever a learning, ever learning, ever changing, ever, changing, ever evolving. adapting, evolving. Exactly. And and not to say that those who created the laws are like, well, we'll just create this for today and see what happens tomorrow. Obviously, that doesn't <coughs> have things ever happen. But but the very fact that our law has that as the word, I think, is a great entree into us being able to understand and and really be able to think about law as it you know started in the Torah. And as it progresses, as we progress, which brings us to, you know, when people say what makes the conservative movement unique, there are a few things I might talk about. I might say, you know, in contrast to the orthodox movement, fill in the blanks, what would you say? In contrast to the orthodox movement, we... Women count. Women count. What else? Great. It's a huge one. Mm -hmm. Is that a hand? Well, I was, I was wondering, does that apply to the rabbis and their standards of... Okay, yes, which Jewish is probably law. where I'm going with right. this, right? How we decide law. Right. We looked a long time ago at that chart that talked about, you know, orthodox, the right way, the only way, this is how God gave it to Moses at Mount Sinai, end of story. And, and then within the conservative movement, lots of different ways of looking at things. The way we do that is that committee, and it is a fascinating committee. They call it either the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards or just the Law Committee for those who are cool and in the know. Um, and only once in my entire lifetime so far have I sat in and watched, and probably the only time, the reason it was the only time is because we were talking about um, uh, shunting or stunning, what's the word, stunning animals. Mm. Um, before killing them, and I was yeah. so grossed out by it that I was like, if this is what they're talking about, I have no interest. Now, little did I know that they also talk about really exciting things. Um, you know, recent years, this law committee, so it's this committee, and it's, you know, a whole bunch of rabbis. I think Rabbi Rosen, I know Rabbi Rosen was on it for a certain point, you know, earlier in his career. It's obviously a huge honor to be on it. Um, and then there are a couple different lay people who don't get to vote, but represent the different arms of the world. Uh, the Jewish world, that is. Um, and, you know, so an issue comes up, but pause right here. Go back a, a thousand years. 
you lived in some little shtetl, some little village somewhere, and you didn't have a rabbi, or your rabbi wasn't the smartest rabbi, or you knew that Rashi or Maimonides or or you know some the Vilna Gaon, some great rabbi lived you know a hundred miles away. What did you do? You had this issue in your community. What did you do? You didn't no, have a you meeting. Asked the rabbi you what? asked the rabbi in a letter. You wrote a she'ela, a question, and you sent it with a messenger. Now it's kind of funny because the question is, oh my goodness, my wife doesn't know she should take this kugel out of the oven. Can she take it out of the oven on Shabbat and put it back in, right? And you're like, well, let me send it. Let me write it mm -hmm. with a beautiful, you know, handwritten introduction, obviously, to the, you know, dear, beautiful, wonderful rabbi. May you live to be 120 and may your children and children see your children. You know, it's whole beautiful. There's a collection of literature called She'elot Uchuvot, questions and answers. We, we do an acronym. We call it SHUT. Um, and there's, there's volumes upon volumes of these uh, questions and answers written, you know, mostly like medieval times and whatever, when there were these villages established and these great big rabbis everywhere. You would send this long letter to the rabbi. The rabbi would think about it, would eventually write back to you and say, this is what you should do. And you can't then say, well, I'd like to ask a different rabbi. Like, you know, I'd like to use my lifeline. That's not work. Like, right, you can't shop your rabbi. This is your town, and your town always goes to that rabbi. Now, another rabbi might hear about the issue and weigh in, but... Not so often. So we've developed this concept of, of asking and answering. That's, so now, the issue comes to the law committee, okay? And somebody says, um, so, so sometimes the issue is something that, you know, has come up in general in the world. Um, and the most, you know, the biggest one of late in the last decade was the gay and lesbian issue, right? Finally, it took us in the conservative movement a whole lot longer than it took our reform friends. Um, finally, we realized that, um, you know, all people are created equal, duh. And uh, although, you know, anyone who's laughing, the Catholic Church, I think, is, you know, anyway, we won't go there. Um, and so, um, and so could, you know, could we do gay marriages, was the question. So that was sort of like a general question that, like, everyone wanted to know. There might be more specific questions, like you're in this little small town in, um, uh, you know, you're in Avon, let's just call it, because it's a little more distant, and you've got a little synagogue out there, and your community around you is all elderly, and they're not going to come out at night for the evening minion. But they all need to say Mourner's Cottage. They're all, they all have a loss recently. Can they... No, this is a little weird, because the elderly probably don't have Skype, but let's just pretend in our little world. Can they <laughs> Skype into the minion? Right? And do you count? Do you need to have 10 Jews in the room? Or, you know, so these are the kinds of issues so that they might bring this issue to the law committee. The law committee then says, okay, um, I'm going to appoint the three of you to be a subcommittee to do all of the research. You're the head person. You're going to write about this, but you guys are all working together, and you're going to study it extensively. Um, it could be years before we hear back from you, because you all have, you know, your own jobs too. And then you'll bring it, you'll bring a draft, we'll all review the draft, we will talk about the draft, we will vote on the draft. All of a sudden, you guys hear their draft and you're like, um, actually, I have a totally dissenting opinion. And we're like, fine, then you guys go write your dissenting opinion. So you guys write an opinion. We eventually bring both papers back, and by the way, we could have six papers on the same subject. We read them all. We vote on them all. In, in the controversial, uh, it wasn't about gay marriage specifically, it was about, well, maybe it was about gay marriage specifically in the fall of 2006. Don't quote me on that. It was, it was something with the homosexual issue. And um, they all voted. And one guy who, what was his deal? He's, he's an old friend of mine. Um, his father-in-law wrote one of them, and his teacher wrote the other. And so he actually voted for both. And they were not, they, they were dissent, you know, they did not agree with each other. So that was really interesting. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of uh, talk about, like, how could he do that? But, like, well, how could you not do that, really? Um, and so the way all of the opinions or all of the papers are then recorded, all that you vote, the responsa, is it will say, this paper, I, I printed one out, but didn't know that there was a, letterhead in the printer, so it's hard to read, but this paper was adopted by the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards on the date by a vote of, you know, so here I just printed one out of 17 in favor, four abstaining, 
then they'll list who votes in favor and they'll list who vote who, who abstains or who votes against. Um, and so if it has, and this, it talks about it in there, if it has a, a six votes, it can be upheld. Um, and, and it can be considered like a minority opinion, right? It needs to have sort of a majority of opinion to be considered a majority. But that's irrelevant. No, it's relevant. But now I, as the rabbi, look at this list of rabbis and I say, huh, this particular paper that I'm holding in my hand, I just printed out the one of tattooing and body piercing because I thought that was a fun one and I knew it was short. Um, <laughs> well, I, I really feel that... Um, um, Rabbi Reisner here is one of my teachers. I follow a lot of what he does. I see here that he's abstained from this paper, from, vote, from voting on this. It's going to raise a little red flag for me. Or, you know, um, uh, so the first person who voted for it was Rabbi Cass Abelson, who was Rabbi Rosen's rabbi growing up. I sort of call him my rabbinic grandfather. Um, mm -hmm. So I see he voted for it. I'm like, oh, it's good for me. So, you know, there's a lot of relying on that. Then you get the paper as the rabbi, and you get to make the decision. Now, tattooing and body piercing, you know, we don't have so much uh, control over all of our congregants, but uh, back to the gay and lesbian one, we had a ton of control to be able to say, we're going to do gay marriages here, or we're not going to do gay marriages here. Um, back in the 1950s, the big thing that went on was, anyone have an idea? Yeah, whether you can take transportation yes. to synagogue or do you need to just walk? Right. See, back to your walking. Mm -hmm. Right? On Shabbat. And the reason was? In the older days, you lived close enough to your synagogue. In current society, you have moved out to the suburbs. Exactly. And so in the 50s, we were all building our synagogues here, but still living there. Mm -hmm. And that's when the issue really came about. Or maybe some of us had already moved here and the synagogue was there. It was a little bit back and forth. So could you drive? The famous, infamous driving teshuva. Again, teshuva is a word for uh, repentance, we talk about on the high holidays, and the word for answer, for response. And so the response that came out, the responsum, singular, responsa, plural, um, the response that came out, the driving tshuva basically eventually said, you know what, while driving's not okay, because, you know, you're, you're, we don't lose electricity on Shabbat, so you're driving, you're creating the spark, you're going, you might be tempted to stop, what ha you know, stop at McDonald's, or, no, let's say stop at Starbucks. Um, <laughs> what if the car breaks down, then you're going to go use a phone, or you're going to try to fix it. We don't fix things on Shabbat. You know, what? It, what is this going to lead to? You know, it's going to lead to you stopping at the mall on the way home. I mean, just like, oh my goodness, the floodgates. On the other hand, if we don't let you drive to synagogue, you're just going to drive everywhere to those other places and not to synagogue anyway. And so, um, in what has been heralded by many as a really big mistake, Stake in the movement is probably what saved the movement. That being said, again, the paper is voted on. It comes to the rabbis, and what is the rabbi called? The Mara Daatra, the master of the land. <laughs> um, the rabbi is the master. Rabbi Rosen, in this case, not me. And so he reads the paper, and he gets to decide. And so there were synagogues in the 50s and 60s that said, you know what? Yeah, that's fine. You want to drive to synagogue? You can drive to synagogue. You're not parking in my parking lot. And they would close off the parking lots. I want you to be here. And by the way, that's why, that's why many, if you've ever heard of this, of somebody who goes to an Orthodox synagogue, but they drive and they park a block away, mm -hmm. that's where I think this idea really comes from. It's from people who grew up in the conservative movement, did that, drove, parked a little while away, and walked. And now, you know, they may be Orthodox or go to an Orthodox synagogue, but... Um, they feel that, you know, you still have to park a little bit away. Um, our cousins in Newton, they bought their house on Ward Street, right across the street from their shul, where they go. Um, but they have people that go to the shul that live however far away, that want to go there, and they take a taxi because they say they're not driving. 
they're being driven. But they're paying the taxi driver. Well, <laughs> and that's, that's not a really good loophole. So. Right. There, there are interesting loopholes, right? And, and stretching and, Yes. Us. And you could argue that they know the fee, they know the amount, and so they put the amount in an envelope ahead of time, and so they're not counting the money. Maybe they feel better. People always in New York, when I lived in New York, debated the subways. The subway is going no matter what. Of course, you have to put your metro card through, but... Um, you know, the subway's going with or without you, so, um, you like, know. Like the sh Shabbos elevator in, in Israel that, that just goes Yes, up like the Shabbos elevator, exactly, which is going either way, with, with or without you. Uh, yes, interesting, right. So, so we do find a lot of loopholes. Um, and so, yeah. So the, the master, the rabbi, gets to sort of figure out, at least for his or her congregation, what is going to make sense how we're going to understand all of these laws and bring it, bring it here, right? Um, and so speaking of here, we've got the synagogue as this holy entity. Any thoughts on that? It was in older days, this is where you could say, um, everything Jewish happened, mm -hmm. so that's your Jewish life began and stayed within the complex of the building. Right. So. Right. Certainly a little bit more than it does today, mm -hmm. right? Today the Jewish life has ex expanded, Federation, mm -hmm. the JCC, the schools, right. Um, but still there's a sense that this is a really holy place, right? Even food in my own home that I make, my home is totally kosher, um, mm -hmm. can't bring it into the synagogue. Mm -hmm. Even uh, the knife, my, sometimes my husband cooks um, for, for lunches here and he hates the knife, he's a knife snob, um, <laughs> and he hates the knives here at Bethel, and he, every time he's like, can't I just bring my knife? I'm like, you know the rules, you can't yeah. even bring in. You know, even though our house is totally kosher, you can't do it. And which, you know, therefore, like, you know, if, if anyone else complains to me, I'm like, even I can't bring it in. Don't mm -hmm. feel bad. This is no discrimination. This is just, you know, so we hold is. to the highest. But Rabbi, none of us keep kosher like this at home. Right. Here we do. Mm -hmm. Right. Here we keep Shabbat. It's why I'm always harping on everybody with the cell phones. Right. Like here, mm -hmm. you know, I don't care what you do at home and what your cell phone's for and all of those kinds of things. Here you know, we have a different kind of standard. It's actually um, interesting. We This week in our Torah portion, we talk about this. God tells us, the portion is truma, and God tells us to build a sanctuary, v'shachanti um, v'tocham, and I shall dwell among them. Not, I'll dwell in the sanctuary. I'm going to dwell among them. Meaning? I'll be with you. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. all of them. Yeah. Be with all the people, yeah, around you, within you, right? It's not about the physical as much as it's about the community that's part of the building of this, of this mishkan, of this sanctuary. Um, so, yeah. So it's a, it's a very it's a holy institution. Um, you know, the book at least where we read didn't talk about. Um, you know, social justice in terms of the synagogue, but I think that's a really important thing. I think there is a separate section on social justice. I think it's a really important thing to add in here. Like, I'm always very conscious of asking the guys to do something that I, like, you know, make them move a million chairs around for a program that's not really going to happen. It's like, it kills me. Um, so I'm always very aware of, like, how can we... How can we remember that, like, you know, this is a this is a building like any other building, like the schools and like the federations and like the, you know, that have to function and have to have things happening, but but it's a synagogue. Like, it, this is, you know, a holy place. And how do we how do we honor that? And how do we, you know, remind these people that they're they're also holy, holy employees? So I forgot. I wanted to just show you on this, although it's really hard to read. Um, so the, 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 the responsa on body piercing, tattooing and body piercing, just so you see the structure of what happens here. So they ask a question, is body piercing, nose, navel, etc., and tattooing permitted? Does it preclude taking part in synagogue rituals or being buried in a Jewish cemetery? Right? Okay, then the answer, then the next thing is the tshuva. This question deals with two separate issues, body piercing and tattooing. It also deals with three different implications 
of these two issues. My rabbis are as annoying as lawyers, right? <laughs> One, the question of permissibility. Two, participation in synagogue rituals. And three, burial in a Jewish cemetery. So of course we have to go through all of these things. And by the way, you can find all of these if you go to rabbinicalassembly.org um, is our website of um, all different, uh, everything connected to um, rabbis. And you <laughs> click on, it's different when you're not a member, so you click on something that says like law or resources or something. If you type in the search, you can just type in CJLS and you should find it or law committee. Um, and it will give you a very, very long index. Everything. Um, some things you don't want to know the answers to. <laughs> Trust me. Um, but everything from, um, you know, dealing with people, everything they've written about, it's indexed, it's online, it's fascinating to read. So the way they do it is they walk through, here's the line in the Torah that says, you shall not make gashes in your flesh for the dead, nor incise any marks on yourselves, I am the Lord. So, okay can't do it, right? And it goes on and it's quoting and it's quoting and all these all these ideas. It's really hard to read when you print it like this. Um, just when I get to, then he talks about body piercing. And then, you know, and they're going to bring in both the specifics, you know, like how they're interpreting the verse and also some big concepts like that we're created in God's image, that we have to be, you know, kind to everybody. What else might come in with this kind of a conversation? Think practical and current. The Holocaust. The Holocaust, right. And, you know, obviously with, with people who have survived the Holocaust and have tattoos, how are you going to tell them they can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery? That's why this question, only in the last 70 years, is a very different question than we would have asked a long time ago. Um, and certainly also the prevalence of body piercing and tattooing. And by the way, in case you're wondering, the answer, well, hold on. So he, <laughs> um, the conclusion. Let's see if I like the conclusion. Tattooing, let's see if you all like the conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> tattooing is an explicit prohibition from the Torah. However, those who violate this prohibition may be, oh, I should have asked you first what you thought the answer was going to be, too late, sorry, <laughs> may be buried in a Jewish cemetery and participate fully in all synagogue ritual. While no sanctions are imposed, the practice should continue to be discouraged as a violation of the Torah. Body piercing is not prohibited, although legitimate concerns regarding modesty and other, oh, a typo, and other, other traditional Jewish values, we've got to tell them that, should be taken into consideration and guide one's choices. In other words, while well, you can pierce up here, if you're piercing your belly button, what are you doing that for? To walk around with your shirt half up? That's sort of a uh, <laughs> modesty concept there. Um, at, all, at all times, the Jews should remember that we are created in God's image. We are called upon to incorporate this understanding in all our decisions. So in the end, it actually comes pretty lenient. Um, you know, without reading all the stuff on the inside, and again, this is like no judgment on anyone who has anything, and I don't mean to make anyone feel bad about it. Um, it's, you know, the reality for a lot of people, um, and so I just thought it would be an interesting one to look at. Um, and so again, like, you know, what, what this would say to me as the rabbi of this synagogue is, aha, so when somebody comes, and I once had this guy come to convert, literally like chin to toe, tattooed every time, every single part of his body, um, and you know I had to explain like this is okay. Um, but when the seventh grader comes and says I want to get a tattoo, I'm like absolutely not, and let's sit down, and I'm going to tell you um, in no uncertain terms why you are not getting a tattoo. But but Rabbi, the Holocaust. My grandfather had a tattoo, and he's buried in the cemetery. But that was in his it. choice. Exactly. There's a, a lot about choice here. There's a lot about, you know, that is one generation and one situation. But I don't know how many of you heard this ridiculous thing. It was in the Times like a couple months ago of a, a granddaughter who decided to tattoo her grandfather's number on her arm oh, as a way of, you know, <coughs> you know, remembering and honoring. But, like, do you actually think the grandfather would appreciate that? I'm not so sure. So... Yeah. Question. Um, how is the committee selected? Oof, good question. I don't know. 
just curious. Uh, you have to be super duper smart. <laughs> is it? It's not a. Is it a voting process? I, I'm sure it's some sort of. Um, Appointing, or, or you know, it must just be an appointing kind of thing. I was actually just appointed to the nominations committee. That means I am not super smart, but I must be very social and know everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm, I'm climbing the ladder, but no, because I would never be one of those people to like, you know, have the patience or the energy or the, you know, whatever to sit and, and research. Because you have to be experts. I mean, go and read one on you know, uh, in vitro or, or on uh, organ donation or on, um, you know, something with taxes or something. I can't even give you a title. But, like, they're like, you have to, the rabbi, I mean, like, we didn't learn these things in rabbinical school. Well, actually, we learned a little bit about, you know, the, the medical ethics, but, like, not enough. I learned enough to be able to sit by somebody's bedside and be like, so they're pulling the plug. Um, but not mm -hmm. enough to, like, know what's happening in the body. Anyway, so, um, you know, they have to be real experts. Oh, and so great. I think that these are people who really, you know, prove themselves. Um, I believe, could be wrong, but I know that Rabbi Rosen, I think he actually wrote <coughs> one about disabilities in the synagogue, um, okay. which would make sense. Go do some yeah. field research and go out and have to interview people or talk to people or something. Oh, yes. Like, you have to become an expert. Right. Yes. You have to, like, absolutely study every mm -hmm. single element. Seems like it could become all-consuming, you know. Really yes. Time-wise. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there are some rabbis who, who... Absolutely. Like, this is what they do. There's one woman in particular, we sort of tease her a little bit. This is on video, I know, but you, you won't share this. Um, and it will take her, like, you know, ten years to write something. I mean, God bless her, I can understand. Like, she's a mom, and she's got a synagogue, and, you know, whatever. But, like, but, you know, this is what she's passionate about this, and she writes, and she writes with such passion and such energy. But, yeah, it takes her forever. Um... So, you know, and the law committee is, like, waiting for her to get back to them. And, mm -hmm. you know, just how, how many um, responses do they put out per year? I mean, it's, it's it depends how big they are and what's going on. They probably meet four to six times a year. They do a lot of email communication. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if something were going on, they might meet more frequently. When it was the gay and lesbian thing, it was, they met off-site in an undisclosed location. Mm -hmm. um, and actually at that one, two of the rabbis from the law committee re resigned from the law committee right then and there. Like, if you're going to pass this I'm teshuva, I'm mm. leaving. I'm out of here. Which was mm. really sad. Because um, our movement is about being pluralistic, you know? And, and so if you think about it, we sort of said, like, what, how we're different from the from the Orthodox movement, we're the, how are we different from the Reform movement? How would you say? Not as lenient. Okay, we're not as lenient, yet. Yeah. I've been asked the question, oh, so is the, con the temple you belong to, is it it's conservative or reform? And I say conservative, and they say conservative leaning towards reform or conservative <laughs> leaning towards Orthodox? Right. Yeah. That's the curse of so, the yeah. middle. Yes. <laughs> it's very hard to be in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. Um, any middle children here? No? Interesting. Um, yeah, but okay, so it's very hard to be in the middle, which is clearly why none of us are. Um, but right, like you're constantly feeling that pull, and that's a question we're constantly asked or even challenged on. You, you guys, you rabbis, you're going to be, you're making us too orthodox. We're like, we're conservative. So that's not only a problem here. That's I, I, I grew up in Beth Israel yep. as a reform, reform synagogue, and there's always a question, oh, is the new rabbi making them, whether it's more orthodox or more conservative, but yes. God, so what's, what is all this right. Hebrew doing in the service? Yes. We don't know if he speaks right. Hebrew. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. that's, yes. that's and, even, <laughs> and even reform, right? Because I, I, my, my mother was, uh, you know, one of the, uh, they called it the Church on the Hill, but it was a reform synagogue in Toronto. <laughs> um, and so it was classical reform, right? And then there's sort of like, what, what's the other term? Like, more like, liberal laid back American reform mm -hmm. sort of thing, right? Um, like, you know, men didn't wear a kippah. Mm. Do men wear head coverings at Beth Israel? Not very often. Okay, not very often. Uh, yeah, yeah, I sort of, I, the, sorry, a few times I'm there. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> right. count, I would say, you know, um, half a dozen tali and right. 20 um, kippah right. women. Wow. Yeah. That's weird. When I hear reform, I, I think of English. Yeah. Like mostly English, almost um, kind of, I, 
I don't want to, I don't mean this term negatively, but almost like a dilution mm. of mm. service light. <laughs> service shorter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> shorter, lighter. And we have people here, obviously, who would love it to be more like that. Um, so it's a challenge. It's a concept. I think conservative is just more of a modern day way of being orthodox. Hmm. And reform is kind of what you want, whatever you want it to be. It is certainly whatever you want it to be, um, where they, they talk about law having a vote, not a veto, right? And, and that being a you know serious way of how they how they interpret things, um, I you know I could say certainly that, that that first part is also right. I think of myself as a traditional feminist Jew um, because I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. And so you know I mean I I probably live like an Orthodox Jew except for you know the keep of the pants and. And you know a couple other things, and maybe the occasional Starbucks. Well, occasional <laughs> daily <laughs> being a rabbi. I think. I think being a rabbi separates yeah. you from the Orthodox. Oh, you, being a female rabbi yeah. separates yeah. me from the Orthodox a little bit. Yes. Mm -hmm. Although they too now have female mm -hmm. rabbis, right? I mean, they are also now. Ah, have you not heard of Rabba, um, Sarah Hurwitz? Um, she was a couple years ahead of me at Barnard, and she is the first ordained female Orthodox rabbi in the United States. Wow. Um, she, well, they don't call her rabbi. Originally, she was called rabbi, and then all the, by, by the rabbi who ordained her is Rabbi Avi Weiss um, oh. in Riverdale. He's sort of a, yeah, yeah you know him? Lovely he was man. here. His brother was here, Menachem. Is he? It, okay. The Hebrew Academy. No, oh. wasn't Avi here? Like years and years ago? Oh, well, maybe before my time? No, yeah. I feel like it's been in Riverdale for ever. Okay. What's okay. bad about Starbucks? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> um, I just meant like in general, like any non kosher establishment. I was going to say because they, I checked kosher. Not all of it. No, but they, it's clearly indicated, especially in West Hartford, what's mm -hmm. kosher. So basically, every drink they have is kosher, except yeah, except it's not candy. But like they're, oh, they're, there's they're levels of kosher. Except drinks. what? <coughs> they're like latte drinks, right? Um, like the gingerbread stuff yeah. isn't necessarily kosher. So the like yeah, they, their milk isn't kosher. Their dairy isn't kosher. Really, they don't get kosher milk. Yeah, like they how do. easy is that? That's how yeah, it's that's like, like, yeah. like the eight of one easiest thing kids. But, but, I, but the only reason I know this is not one of the other girls bring you brings a Starbucks drink here when she comes, and Dave saw it because he's funny. He won't bring. He says, "Well, so Dave goes to a very conservative, conservative." Synagogue and his parents' synagogue is like conservative. Conservative. <laughs> conservative. <laughs> conservative. Um, so like no one's allowed to bring any outside mm -hmm. food or drink in. Right. And so when he saw that, he looked it up, but he was put at ease because um, it says it all. But like four other products are kosher now. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Occasionally, Rabbi Adler will uh, send out from Beth David. He he does all the kashrut in town, and he'll send something out to say. Um, you know, like Pinkberry claims it's kosher. They're not. Sweet Frog wishes they could be. They're not. Inter <laughs> Actually, they're not interested. Um, you know, go to this place, don't go to that place, or whatever. But the machinery at, like the cappuccino maker at Starbucks, isn't kosher. It's made kosher. Well, right? they're not There's like no... frothing ham. Right. Yeah, so why so... wouldn't that be? If but they would make what if they stick but... the thing in the gingerbread stuff in somebody else's cup. Here's why Starbucks isn't kosher. You can get a ham sandwich there. Right? You, you can get, yeah. I mean, the baked goods are not kosher. So yeah, that's no, what makes it. Drinks, right. Yeah, like so, like, I or... actually, I'm a little inconsistent. I wear my kippa all the time. I wear it in Starbucks 99% of the time that I'm there because I'm almost always getting a drink. I do on occasion get those morning buns for my, for my son most, <laughs> most of the time. Um, <laughs> how he discovered them, on the other hand. Um, and so when I'm buying pastries, I often feel a little, uh, you know, like this is not really consistent with who I am and what I should be doing. Because if I go to Panera, I take my kippah off. Um, mm -hmm. You know, But so. do you think, so what if you're in a Starbucks, though, in Bishop's Corner, and it is kosher, they don't have any ham? They do have but, ham. No, I'm not saying that they don't. I'm just saying, like, oh. in a community, like, you could be in a part of New York and go into a... 
a chain where they don't have ham because they have mostly a Jewish community. So, do you really think that they would actually do that? There was a Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> in the Upper West Side that was kosher. The Dunkin' Donuts for here. There were when we moved four here, used that to be were kosher. used to be right. Yeah, there but I think people that twenty years ago that Dunkin' Donuts used to be. Yeah, I have a girlfriend that's kosher. Because we can tell them let's let's all completely a hundred. I mean, two sinks, two yeah. everything. Such this is, she will not, she will not eat out unless it's like K O U certified. Absolutely everything in there kosher. She, even if she has a bottle of water, she just she won't. She just and there are tons so of people strict. like that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, so everyone's going to have their different levels, right. um, and you know, which is why the crown is a huge. Uh, source of contention for this community, right? It is kosher enough <laughs> for Bethel. Uh, when I first moved here, we didn't let crown food into our house because I was friendly with a whole bunch of, you know, the young people in the Orthodox community, and I wanted to feel like I could say to them, you can come to my house. Mm -hmm. After a while, I realized if they wanted to come to my house, they would eat my food. Um, and if my husband was shopping, he was going to shop, you know, where he wanted to, and enough with this. And the crown, I, I've actually subbed in as the mashkiach, the one who checks the kosher. Mm -hmm. I know it's kosher. So, you know, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. But if other people are, have to, people have their issues. People absolutely have different standards. Um, so, you know, if it's a federation event, I'll, do you ever use crown? No. Yeah, uh, crown, absolutely. Really? Yeah. I'm shocked. It depends Don't on... Don't we get catered? Yeah, we don't. Where else would Bethel. you go? You Yossi, Yossi, Schumann. Yossi, Schumann. Schumann yeah. Really? A Federation event like a Voices would never use crown. Oh, not for, no. not for Voices, they don't use crown. No. But only so because it's meetings. not. But for meetings, I, I mean, for I live on, on crown it. turkey sandwiches. Mm -hmm. For meetings that are like Federation, Federation board meetings? Well, we don't have food for those. But, <laughs> yeah, but, but, um, but like, how big a meeting? Is, like you and three other people in an office? No, no, no. I'm shocked. Are, are there no so Orthodox people on this committee? Um, like if there are, we might, we might, um, all to, we might stick to non-meat. We might not bring in just tuna fish cooked. and and salad. So they won't, um, but like, from the crown. So yeah, yeah we, um, yeah, if it's like Yossi kosher catering. If there's 20, 50 people we know, every single day if Dane Costin is coming, we'll be a little more and sensitive and things like that. Yeah, they have a dairy kitchen. It's so separate and. They literally but is people okay? Like certain yes. things have to come. Yeah, I remember when we first moved around. here, people were like, "Oh, the crown is not." You know what? And, and yeah. go to Til whatever was called. Isn't that funny? Until like, Rabbi Adler came, more kosher than right? The crown. But it's even crown better now. Was it's kosher for it's, for the whole thing everybody. is on the other side of the grocery yeah. store now. I know. We were in the day. Remember? When Rabbi Adler came, I know. I went over there. I'm sitting there like, "He's the one who made the divide happen." Oh, they moved it. It's it's now in front. I knew they were putting it in the middle. Let's try to have one conversation here. Woo! So, Hushrud got you off on something here. Okay. When, yeah. when I was like 16, and I didn't even know what Judaism was. I mean, I did, obviously, but I didn't know. I uh, worked for a catering facility, and the biggest like culture shock was when they had a they had a bat mitzvah, and it was like totally kosher, and they had to come in, and they had everybody, and I just low torches. It was I was whoa. So it's uh, intense. <laughs> you know the West Hartford days. So Guy is part of um, Yossi, mm. had helped get that started, but we, uh, something about the oil, we had to drain the oil, we had, the Mishki made us find a rock, we couldn't find a rock, so we had to find a brick, we took a brick and dumped it in the oil, yeah. some prayer thing, I was like, what the <laughs> heck is going on here? I don't understand yeah. it, and it took like three hours longer than it should have, all just because yeah, of some I'll rock. I'll never I was forget like, that, what? being 16 and being like, what is we going on? Like who? I had, I couldn't tell you. We were no, at no, work. Yeah, it's uh, Allegra now in Brantford, but it used to be Woodwinds. So now it's uh, Woodwinds by Allegra or Allegra mm -hmm. by Woodwinds down in Brantford, Connecticut. I'll never forget that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It, it can it can my be intense. Wedding, we had to pay the mishkia, you know, and, and my mother having me having converted, you know, however many years before my actual wedding, and then my mother flipping out over having to just pay the mishkia to come in and like check over everything. She's like, mm -hmm. what? That's crazy! And I'm like, mm -hmm. that's the way the world so goes around. What do they, like, they just check the label on the package? Now the mashkiach um, makes sure that everything is prepared appropriately. 
that uh, counters are covered, that, you know, the custodians aren't, you know, also making something dairy um, while you're getting your meat meal ready, um, that yes, that like, you know, every ingredient that was purchased was kosher. Uh, when you're a mashkiach, you look through the broccoli heads yeah. to make sure that there's no bugs in them. Uh, the lettuce as well. Broccoli is a real hard one. There are actually some very, very yeah, religious sure. rabbis who say that broccoli is no longer kosher because we can't see well enough to get the bugs out. Same with currants, not raisins, but currants. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and on occasion you'll hear these things that the rabbis of, you know, uh, what's it called, Lake, Lake, Lakewood? <laughs> <laughs> huh? Don't they die in hot water? Don't they die in the hot water? Like, don't they boil out? Uh, yes. You can probably <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. So, yeah, like, you can say that about, can say that about practically You can anything. say that about anything, but it's harder with broccoli. And so they're watching to make sure that the way the so food is prepared. The entire time. Uh, so yeah. there are two different kinds of being a mashkiach, which is actually what the crown issue is. One kind of mashkiach is called a mashkiach timidi, a constant, always present mashkiach who very often when you serve in this role, you actually sort of become like the sous chef because you're checking everything. Hey, can you, Rabbi, just wash this for me. Rabbi, it's, ugh. Um, <laughs> the other kind is what they call yotzei v'nichnas. He goes out and he comes back in, which is basically to say as long as he's like around he or she and the presence is sort of, a, you know, they're aware of his presence, um, they're not going to make a mistake because they know he's going to come back. Um, so when we, do, so the crown, um, hires somebody who basically is a rabbi who works rather part-time at this point there and so he comes in he's there for a little while he leaves when he's on vacation um, I go in you know and and I'm sure you've probably never been behind him downstairs in the crown but um, no matter what shoes I'm wearing I'm terrified of it because um, first you have to for the bakery you have to walk up this ramp up behind the five o'clock shop and there's you know and then it's like tile and there's flour all over the place and then mm -hmm. you have to walk back down the ramp but you now have tile you have flour on your shoes mm -hmm. and so I'm like this bubby <laughs> you know holding the wall <laughs> totally terrified um, and when I go up into the bakery I have to take the bread they've separated out the challah one thing is when you make a whole lot of, of challah use a whole lot of dough uh, flour you have to separate out a bit and throw it into the oven to burn it. So I have to do that and say, bless you, so I'm opening this huge oven and doing that. Okay, get down the ramp. Oh, I survived that. Next, you have to go into the meat area. And the meat area, you know, if you go in on a good day, you'll find like this huge cow hanging and dripping blood and like water. And so now the floor is wet. So you're bringing in your shoes with the flour into the water. Okay, and you have to go again up a little ramp into the frozen meat Thing. And all I can think of is, is it Bobby or Peter Brady from the Brady Bunch getting stuck in Sam's meat oh, closet? Yeah. <laughs> Half of the room totally gone. Are you too young to know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They're too young. I don't know. I don't watch the Brady Bunch. I never watched it. I mean, I know what it is. <laughs> all right. Wow, that was really funny. <laughs> you totally didn't laugh. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> Anyway, getting stuck in Sam's meat closet. Meat, uh, anyway, so I think of that every time. And then you have to go downstairs and you have to watch all the guys, uh, you know, and they're preparing the food. And that, that for me is, a, is also very challenging because, you know, it's hot and blah, blah. And, and the guys are all just so excited that it's not Rabbi Press. I mean, he's a lovely man, but he's the same guy they see every day. It's, oh, Rabbi, how are you? And so it's like this whole, and I'm like, mm -hmm. work. Put gloves on. Uh, how you doing over there? And so that's what, and so, but I do it. I walk through. I'm like, I felt a little bit like the queen. I'm like, yeah, how are you? And then I'm done. Mm -hmm. That's why there are issues with the crown. So then <laughs> Big Y has somebody there all the time? Big Y has somebody there all the time. Really? Yes. The butcher, the, the butcher part, <laughs> like the actual place where they're cutting the meat, has hours on the door. Mm -hmm. So they're not always there. So they're not I there. I'm going to notice that next time. Yeah. I've never they're noticed that. They're not there all of the that hours. That was like a sticking that point of the open. sale, though, wasn't it? Was that? Say that again? Wasn't that a sticking point yes. of Big White buying yes. it, though? Was, that was the whole. They were going to keep the blue. meat the mm -hmm. kosher. Yeah, right. Kosher. Were they going to have the meat section? Mm -hmm. uh, I remember section. why the rabbi made us do that. is because I worked the Saturday at the Yossi stand, and I was not Jewish. So when he came in on uh, Sunday... 
and they were able to open. And I was like, listen, I followed all the rules. He was like, I don't care you're not Jewish. They got to start. Yossi had fresh. his stuff operating on that Saturday. It's because no, Stanford. none, he, because I was not Jewish, I could sell kosher food. He added awesome. it, he and got it approved. <laughs> That's know interesting. But I think he, he does it every. Every um, yeah. <laughs> it's a tough economy. Do it every yeah, you gotta sell when you can. I don't know if he does it anymore. Uh, that's, but that's um, nobody, <laughs> nobody Jewish was allowed to oh, work. I want nobody Jewish to be allowed to buy the food. Oh, then nobody you, would be at West Hartford days. <laughs> <laughs> are you gonna work it this year? Oh, I have nothing to do with any of that okay. anymore. <laughs> Good. That was like, interesting. Yeah. We we were we were beginning help. Now I. Don't You're done. Anymore. <laughs> are there certain done. parts of the cow that are kosher? Yeah. Certain parts of the cow that are not are kosher. Not kosher. That's what I meant. I'm sorry. Yeah, the no? back yeah. end. Yeah. The tenderloin. That's what I thought, right? Tender the cut. The tenderloin cut is not kosher. The whole um, rump, the, the hanger steak is not kosher. All the back end. Mm. Yeah, like all isn't the, it like from here on up is? I don't, and I don't, I don't know. Is it really type of thing or? Want to think about? I just feel like I heard that somewhere. I think that's probably not. There are cuts of meat that are not. Yeah, that's what I thought. That even if you don't buy kosher meat, there are cuts of meat that are still not oh. appropriate to eat. So that's a whole other world. It is a it whole is. other world. Um, and I, so I don't know if we, we talked about keeping here. kosher. Are yes. we going we're to? Going we to. have. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to or we have? No, we're going to. No, okay, no, good. Oh, I'm looking for a section on it. I mean, we, we have a we whole section on keeping kosher. Well, you know, we sort of go over all of these things until we May. Um, at first yeah, in May, like first cheap, in May. Cheap, it says about? what all the symbols mean, mm -hmm. because there's so many symbols that are still coming back. And I like hope yeah, you, can got, you can find like 15 of them in Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you can find like three sometimes in the same box. Yeah. I get so confused. I'm like, well, oh, because I look at all the symbols. Because if you're Orthodox, you only go by... Depends. Oh, there's no, there's no, there's no one now. standard law for any of that. That's what's, you know, so yeah. interesting here with all of these things. So, um, as we draw to a close, there was one other part of this that I found really interesting that it brought up in here, um, and that was the topic of Messianic Jews. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if there's one thing that sort of, um, I don't know, I was, I was proud that they brought it up. Uh, thoughts, questions, experiences? I was struck how um, so much of what we've talked about, everything is kind of, sort of, sometimes, it depends. This was quite black and white. Black and white. <laughs> yes. 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 Right. So somebody who, so just to just to reiterate, right, is like someone who, you know, either was born Jewish and then sort of decides to accept Jesus, or, uh, was you know was born Christian and decides to add the Jewish stuff on. Uh, you can't be both. Yossi might be able to <laughs> find this loophole that I'm not liking. <laughs> I think it's more uh, of he's a, catering a, a party for me on Sunday night, and now I'm mad at him. Money. Yeah. <laughs> not in, okay. in your family. Yeah. Like I always yeah. say to people with the menorah and the Christmas tree in the window confuse me. Yeah. yeah. And I know they're trying to do something with right. the whole interfaith aspect of their household or whatever mm -hmm. it is. But I always feel like you need to pick one and just. Yeah, but, so. but that is different. So education. I don't think a Christmas tree represents is. that you're in love with Jesus Christ. Yeah, it could absolutely. Just be no. that you Traditional aspects of it for that family. Side yeah, or... although I know plenty of people who actually like grew up that they never went to a single church service. Right. But a Christmas tree is where the presents go, and that's why you have it. Right. And there are people who will say, I'm not religious. I'm pretty, like, I, right. I know people who, right. previous to converting, were basically atheists, but they still don't mind a tree. It's not offensive to them because it has no truly a material no, representation. Yeah. It's true holiday. It's, there's a religious that's, holiday in the commercial. That's how it is yeah. more in my family, too. They're not religious by any means, mm -hmm. but it's just such a family tradition that mm -hmm. there's no church going. So, no, so that like being Easter said, Easter. let me go on record as saying that I don't recommend a tree <laughs> in any Jewish home. Um, that, you know, for those who are converting to think about being able to say, yes, and the tree is in my parents' home where I came from, and we can go there, especially those of you right. who might down the road 
you know, have children, um, this is a, you know, we can go and celebrate and very much honor and respect their holiday. And by the way, if that means that grandma and grandpa take the kids to church, like, do I want them, you know, uh, do we accept communion on Christmas? I'm you gonna... can't, well, depending on your church, you don't accept communion if you're not a part of that Ah, person. right. Okay. Yeah. So do I want them, like, you know, running up there and being part of it? No. Um, is it okay to go respect somebody else's? Absolutely. And we should be encouraging that. And they should know where their mother came from and what was important to her family. And But it should stay out of the home. But this is very different, right? That whole interfaith thing or, or, or converting and then, you know, sort of remaining somewhat in touch with, family, respecting yeah. where you came from is very different from this, which is really, you know, back to the having your cake and eating it too and really trying to say. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some guys who sit in Panera. Um, I used to very religiously, especially over the summers, I sit there and write my sermons. Um, and there are some Jews for Jesus. There's a, there's a place, place in, in Bloomfield. Bloomfield, right. And it's got a front, right? It's got some, it's a Cafe Shalom or Just something like that. Yeah. I've don't never, don't, I've don't, I don't need to laugh. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, yeah. So, let me tell you all a little bit about it. Okay. So, so there, it's right near Ginza. Never. It's like right in that Wintonberry oh, area. Okay. okay. On the back That's side. where it is. The back side of the okay. Ginza Plaza. Okay. Uh, it's called Cafe Shalom or something. Shalom Cafe. And, um, and I've never been there, so I can't tell you more about it. But it is sort of like the front and the money maker for this messianic Jewish, uh, really? Jews for Jesus, whatever you want to call it, uh, congregation. And I have sat this close to them in Panera to these guys and like it's two guys that come and they're trying to convert the third guy and what's funny is they're all guys in their 60s um, at least that I'm always watching and it's like they're all like I know I personally don't know what they live through but like I'm like oh you're like every 60 year old guy in my show like I know exactly who you are and you know and they're all sort of like kibitzing talking and, and connecting on this level and it's it's very very you know I'll, I'll often like post on Facebook like Jews for Jesus are at it again, and I want to scream. <laughs> um, it's uh, you know, and so they really, they really feel that. So, so my point about like the fact that they're these sixty-year-old guys—they're the guys you know, right? <laughs> um, they're, they're the Garys. They're the you know, they're the guys you know. Um, and 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 you know, in some way, they must have been searching and seeking and. The, these guys come, and one of them even has this really long ponytail. I mean, he looks like straight out of the 60s. Um, and he's Poor like, Jesus Christ, super <laughs> <laughs> right? And he's talking about how, you know, Jesus saved his life and whatever. And, 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 and you know, it's, it's Bashert, right? He's like quoting like Hebrew and Yiddish <laughs> while he's talking about Jesus. And it's, it's like, it seems wrong. wrong. It seems exactly. wrong. No, it's just, it it's is just wrong. Like in a, like, uh, what is it? Missionary. It's an oxymoron. Yeah. 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 Well, Jews don't proselytize. Right. Jews for Jesus, they do. And right. so they will be out on college campuses. Yeah. Um, I did July 4th in Manhattan one year, and as we were leaving, we, everyone was being handed a postcard for Jews for Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they, they will very actively try. Um, and... Um, it does keep me up at night. I, you know, I don't hate many people or m many things, but I, I, I feel like the deception that they are trying to do. It's okay to not be Jewish, right? Like, it's okay to love Ju Jesus. It's okay. But don't, don't try to, you know, confuse a Jew and say, like, this is, you can have this too. That's not part of our equation. And so I think the, you know, the, the thing that the book was trying to really say was, like, do not deceive do not, do not think for one second that this is okay. Don't let it anywhere near you. Not because we don't love people who love Jesus. We all do. Um, but once you, you know, once you bring Jesus into the picture, um, you can't be Jewish. Oh, yeah. It seems more than like a moral and ethical standpoint as well. It just, yeah. like you're not being, I guess you are being true to yourself, but you're not being true to, I guess, all of you. I don't know, it yeah. doesn't sit well. Correct. On that note. <laughs> okay, going yeah. back to the food thing. So if you're not eating you your food on Saturday, but what if you're, like, they're sold in supermarkets that are open Saturdays and Sundays? Yeah. Like, it's, okay. you know, because they're... 
Okay, so I think the argument would be, like, you work for Entenmann's, and they happen to be kosher, but lots of people buy Entenmann's, right? You pay a little extra to make sure that, that, that your stuff is kosher, so Jewish people, kosher people right. buy it too. You are a kosher catering facility that, you know, okay, non-Jews eat falafel, but um, on Shabbat, you know, you shouldn't, I mean... Uh, there are there are certain communities. I don't know the answer for this community. There are certain communities that will say a, a kosher establishment can be open on Shabbat. Um, see, the reason I mean everything you're saying about what happened on Sunday is sort of the reason, right? Like it can't be open on Shabbat because there were no Jews to run it, and what have you made it all non-kosher? That's one part of it. The other part of it is why right, should I'm not really making the food? I'm just. I know, but what selling is selling prepackaged stuff yeah. that's already you're been the delivery okay. service. And why you have and to have just, like a keep it on if you're in. That way you have to take it off if you go into and right. not because it's if someone walks by, and and recognizes that as something, then right, they could they be they might seen think to it. think so that right. it's like a deception. So many kosher point. food that is sold in so many stores yeah. that are open seven days a week. Well, well in fact, in right. why. Um, the poultry section, the fresh poultry, is available for sale on Shabbat. Meats are not, obviously the deli counter is closed, but the chicken and that was put out the day, but prepackaged, I mean, well, and even right. local, well, no, maybe it's all Empire, maybe it's all, all Empire. Maybe it's all I empire, think the yeah. point, yeah. though, like is not that, the Big Y yeah. is a, a chain grocery store that the purpose of it functioning is to service the community. The reason you open up Jews for Jesus or uh, a specific conservative, orthodox, completely kosher establishment is to serve a segment of the population. Mm -hmm. So if you're serving a segment that has a very traditional belief, then I think that's what you're stating it is the difference. It's not like they're they're not a big Y. They're not purporting to be anything that they're not. Big Y is to serve well, a community. This is to serve I a that's segment. All serve I think that's I think that's all true. But, the but you know I'm uncomfortable with you <coughs> making money on Shabbat. Right? And by the way, we rent a booth at Celebrate West Hartford, but only on Sunday. Because even though I know that half the congregation is there on Saturday, um, but we're not going to be there, and the booth sits empty, and why should we, and I don't know, maybe maybe some of the Reform synagogues are there. I don't think the JCC is there. I don't think the Jewish, right. I, don't I don't think, think the Federation is there. I, remember, I don't think we're there. I think we only go on I Sunday. think, I mean, because it's bad form. Right, right. Yeah. But, you it's, know, it's, even it's, though all the Jews are there. Yeah, but what about, I feel like it's, a, it's not... It's not a service. It's not like you're, I don't know, I don't feel like you're promoting a synagogue or something Jewish you're promoting. It, well, it does seem to be, if it's, if it's a, Yossi's booth, that I can see where there's a problem. If Yossi, as a supplier, because he does supply to Big sure. Y, and then if he, if he happens to have a supplier who chooses right. to have a booth and sell his wares, it right. seems yeah. to me there's right. a like distinction there. Right, like it's connected to Whole Foods. Right. It's not but like just I, him part, like he Right, so if it's, if it's a Whole Foods booth that right. happens to have Yossi's booth, that's different. A, different. And it, we had a booth, well, it was part of Whole Foods. Like, it's not mm. like we just went... So you know. that's probably the loophole in how he got around it. But then it's funny that... that that really makes everything up. Deal right. On Sunday. Yeah. right. But, I mean, I patronize someone like Yossi because I'm believing that his establishment is kosher up to the standards that I want it to be. And by kosher, I mean, you know, following all the laws, Shabbat mm -hmm. included. Um, would I would I be upset if I found out he was cooking my food but on Shabbat? So, but even, yeah. Yeah. even yeah. there's... Right, but that's what I'm saying. There's no food being... Right. What about the kosher it's caterers all, during it's bat all mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs that go to synagogues? Cold. They're not cooking it on Shabbat. Not, it's all done. But okay. they're still allowed to serve it and do yeah. all that. That's mm -hmm. considered. Yes. So Different people to, come yeah, in. But they don't get paid. Non Jews They won't get paid on Saturday. Yeah. And they wouldn't get the company wouldn't get paid on Saturday. Like, they require yeah. payment. He's on the world. Yes. <laughs> right. You, know, right. You, know, you still get paid. Really, I this still get gray paid. area is growing. <laughs> yeah. You still get paid for what you do, but you'd have to be paid beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I don't feel like it's a loophole so much as no. we're trying to keep a, a, a really tradition. conservative right. tradition Which it makes in a modern day. So yes. you have to create ways that you right. still function. Right. Right. So I think it's Everything. completely legitimate that you expect that payments made the day before, so it doesn't happen. I think those are all things that really adjust to keep <laughs> traditional <laughs> alive. Right. So yeah. that it's all non-Jewish 
staff that <coughs> runs yes. it. Then. Yes. Right. Ah, okay. Oh, and this is such a nice segue into next week. Now, I have not read this packet. If it's not good, halacha, we're talking about Jewish law, so mm -hmm. there we'll get to continue all of this. Um, the packet, hopefully you have it, page 49 to 95. Um, if it's not good, <laughs> it was okay. It was okay? Did you read Go to myjewishlearning.com. Exactly. <laughs> Take a look. And you know what? Let me challenge you with something else. Ooh, this could be really fun. If you have time, and the lawyers are going to love this, go to rabbinicalassembly.org. Look up one teshuva. If you forget how to do it, email me and I'll remind you. But basically, you know, type in CJLS and you'll get them all. Look one up and take a little time. They're very long, some of them. Do not read a 60-page one. Um, see if you can find a shorter one. If you're interested, you know, print one out and bring it in. Um, and let's take a little look. And you don't have to understand it all. And unfortunately, they thought they were doing something really cool. And actually, when I was in college, this was one of my little uh, internship things, where they made me go through, and every time the word was in Hebrew, um, this was way back at the beginning of computers, they made me highlight it and change it to Hebrew. Uh, sorry, every time the word was in English letters, they made me change it into Hebrew letters, um, mm -hmm. which means that, like, things are not always translated. So it might be a little, you know, not fun. Uh, just pretend that's Latin and keep going. <laughs> All right? We will have so much fun. Have a great week, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. And let's make this stop. Yeah, we're here till 9.30, right? No, next week, I thought. No, next yeah. week. Oh, next week? Okay. Oh, next week's what? Stop.